Man, it's good to see you. Second service, man. Guess what? Our first service was packed. Because everybody got an extra hour of sleep, man. Now here you guys are. Life's good to us. No miss November, man. Pick something that'll make you more like Jesus and do it every day this month. Don't miss a day. Being thankful is one of those things, all right? Pray every day. Read your Bible every day. The idea comes from 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will in Christ Jesus for you, man. And I've done this before where you just write down something you're thankful for. That, and, uh, you know, it starts off really easy, actually. It's actually very easy to do. It's kind of like what I call low-hanging fruit. You know, you'll be happy for your, thankful for your family or, you know, thankful for your job or whatever. But what you'll notice is you'll start seeing stuff everywhere. Like, man, I'm thankful that I got air to breathe. I'm thankful for the sun came up today. I'm thankful we've got a building to meet in, a chair to set in, a car to drive when I got here. You'll start seeing all these things that God's doing in your life. And it will begin to produce gratitude, a sense of gratitude in your life, right? And gratitude leads to generosity, and generosity leads to joy, and you'll be joyful always. It's just the way God works in our lives. So I encourage you to get on that. One more thing before I jump into this sermon. We had a party last Thursday night, a university party at the skate. We had a skate party, and to just give a shout-out to our university, I want to show you a little video we shot, a little answer story. I'll show that at this time just real quick to give you an idea of the little party we had. Look out for the Oompa Loompas coming up here in a minute. <laughs> Flying squirrel. Right there, Baker Mayfield. You see that? He came to our party right there at the end, man. Anyway, just want a little shout out to the university ministry and uh, Nick Storm and Abigail Brown for putting that on. If you've got your Bible, open up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I want to talk to you about being prepared today. And uh, when I was young and I lived with my dad, my dad, there's one thing my mom and dad did every night before they went to bed. They'd watch the 10 o'clock news, all right? I don't know if your parents did this or not, but, uh, you know, back then, that was about the only way you got news. Today, it's, we can get it on our phone, we can get it on the internet 24-7. But back then, you had to watch the news. Now, the thing about the news is almost everything on the news is about the past, right? It's just telling you what happened that day or what the score of the game was, but... There was this one segment of the news that was all about predicting the future. Now, predicting the future is obviously a risky proposition, and these people got it wrong most of the time, but there was one whole segment that wasn't about the past. It was about predicting the future, and what I'm talking about is the weather, right? We're going to watch the weather because the weather is going to tell us what it's going to be like for the upcoming week, and we can be prepared. We can make plans. As well, my dad, he wanted to watch the weather every night so he could be prepared for what might happen. Hey, if it's going to rain, we might stay inside. If it's going to be cold, I'm going to take a jacket. If it's going to hail, I'm going to put my car in the garage. We always want to know what's going to happen so that we can be prepared. And this is the kind of the sense of what you have in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You have the, the Thessalonians are wanting to be prepared. And the reason is we know the story that Paul goes to Thessalonica. He's there for a minimum of three weeks, probably a couple of months, teaching them about Jesus, sharing the gospel. But we also know that he taught them about the second coming of Jesus Christ. But then he had to leave unexpectedly. He got run out of town. He left there. He went to Berea. He went to Athens, Greece. While he's in Athens, he's like, I got to know what happened to those people. He sends Timothy back to check on them. He goes on to Corinth. When he gets to Corinth, Timothy comes back and gives him a report. The report is they're really doing good. The church is doing well. But they've got some questions about the second coming. And one of the questions is some of the people in that church had died. And they're like, dude, did they miss out on the second coming of Jesus? Right? And so if you were here last week, Paul answers that question in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, where he says, brothers, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who have fallen asleep or those that have died. Here's what happens. Here's what's going to happen to those people. And the second question they had was, they said, some of the people say Jesus is going to come back, so they just quit their job and quit working. They're just sitting around waiting for it to happen. And the problem is they don't have anything to eat, so we're having to feed them all the time. What do we do with these people, Right? And Paul says, man, those people got to go back to work. They got to stop being idle. In fact, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul makes a statement, if a man will not work, he shall not eat. 
Tell them to go back to work, man, because we don't really know when Jesus is going to come back. And then the third <laughs> question was, hey, can you tell us when it's going to happen? Can you tell us when Jesus is going to happen? Because if we know when it's going to happen, we can be prepared, Right? And so here you have in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he just gets through answering the questions about those that had died. And now he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, now, brothers, about the times and dates. All right, let's talk about the times and dates. Answer your third question. Now, uh, but you, now, brothers and sisters, about the times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Where people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Let's, let's talk about these times and dates, he said, because people always want to be prepared. Years ago, uh, I was doing a mission trip, I believe, to Belize, taking our high school seniors down there, and uh, we were trying to raise some money, and uh, so we did a garage sale. I got in front of church. I said, hey, if you want to donate anything to the garage sale, if you'll bring it to this location, we're going to sell it, and all the money is going to go to missions. Well, this one guy showed up, and he had three kerosene heaters, a big five-gallon thing of kerosene, and a whole bunch of camping gear, and it was all brand new. It had never been out of the box. So I was like, man, what's all, the, what's all this? It's been a while since I've seen a kerosene heater. How come you got a kerosene heater and, and all this kerosene? You know, what's the deal? And he said, man, I was prepared for Y2K. <laughs> I know maybe some of you don't remember Y2K, but the thought was that on December 31st, 1999, that all the computers in the world were going to quit working because they couldn't handle the year 2000. But it was going to revert back to 1900. They were all going to shut down. And if we lost all our computers, we were going to lose everything else. And, you know, catastrophe was good. So everybody, everybody was prepared for the worst. This guy went out and bought a bunch of kerosene. It's going to be cold on December 31st if we lose our heat tomorrow. So he was prepared. Everybody wants to be prepared. So they're all asking Paul, hey, hey, what's going to What's going to happen, you know, uh, when is this going to happen? And this, this isn't the first question that it was asked. People have been asking this question for a long time. In fact, in Daniel chapter 12, one of the great Old Testament uh, prophecies concerning the end times, at the very last chapter, Daniel chapter 12, someone asked this question, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? How long will it be before all these things Take place. The disciples asked Jesus in Matthew 24. They came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Hey, look, when's this going to happen, man? Even after his resurrection in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, the, the disciples came to him and it says, when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel. And Jesus responded, Acts 1-7, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. In fact, Jesus goes to a great length to tell us that even himself, even he didn't know when the date was set for him to return. It says in Mark 13 26, this is part of what's known as the Olivet Discourse. He said, at that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and great glory, and they said, well, when's that going to take place? And he says in Mark 13, 30, 32, no one knows about the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Jesus says, nobody knows. Paul says, nobody knows. About times or dates, man, I'm just, I'm just here to tell you, nobody knows. So in response to people continually asking, even like the Thessalonians, Paul responds to them, now, brothers, about the times and dates, we do not need to write to you. I've already told you, nobody knows, okay? For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they <laughs> will not escape. Here's the contrast. But you, brothers and sisters, but you believers are not in darkness, so this day should overtake you like a thief. You are all sons and daughters of the light and sons and daughters of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together 
with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. He said, about the times and dates, you do not, I do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now, here's the thing about a thief in the night. Number one, it always comes when it's unexpected. And most of the time, almost all the time, it's unwelcomed for the house to which he comes, right? I actually had my house broke into one time. I lived in Dallas, sitting down on vacation, and uh, someone broke into the back door of our garage, got into our house, and uh, robbed our house, kind of ransacked it. We were gone, and we were real good friends with our landlord, and so Cindy had called him, and, and I think she asked him to go over and do something like, you know, uh, feed the dog or water the plants or whatever, and he calls us up, and he was like, hey, when you left, was your house like really messy? I mean, like really messy? <laughs> and so he was like, no, it was, everything was pretty much put in order when we left. He goes, well, I think you guys have been robbed because your house has been ransacked. And when we got home, man, it had just been ransacked. And, and although we didn't have very much stuff at the time, anything we did have a value, they took. Now, if that ever happens to you, immediately your very first response is when you see it, you're like, dude, I could have been better prepared, Right? I could have had a better lock on that door. I should, have, I should have had something better on that door. I should have been better prepared, right? Because when somebody comes and breaks in your house, a thief in the night, you want to be prepared because he always comes when it's unexpected. He's going to come like a woman, you know. He said, when, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly and unexpectedly as labor pains on a pregnant woman. Now, I don't know what it is. I know many of you parents have gone through this. Your wife gets pregnant, and uh, you know it's coming. You know it's coming. In like nine months, you know, and it, it's growing every day. And, you know, all these days we have this baby. And, you know, you just know, and then it's getting closer. And you're like, any day now, it's going to happen. And then all at once your wife says to you one day, I think I'm having contractions. I don't know about you, but all the men I know are like, what? What? We got to get ready. We got to do. They freak out. Like, I freaked out. I was like, what? Where's the keys to the car? My wife's like, just calm down. They talk me off, man. We just like, I mean, we know it's coming, but when it happens, it's still like, it kind of freaks you out. And then, you know, you got to get them to the hospital and all these different things you have to do. But the thing about labor pains is, is, is you know they're coming, so you should get prepared, right? But here's the thing about it. Once they start, they just continue until the end. Once they start, this thing is going to continue. It's going to happen. Once it starts, it's going to happen, and it's going to get progressively worse as it goes. And so this is the idea, you know, it's going to happen unexpectedly. You better be prepared. And once it starts, right, it's going to continue until it gets there. Jesus himself said, Matthew 24, 44, as you also, so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect it. Now concerning dates and times, Paul says, we do not want to, we don't need to write to you for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. It's going to come unexpectedly. Now that little phrase, day of the Lord, is actually an Old Testament phrase. It's used a number of different times, 22 times in fact in the Old Testament and it's Paul who connects the day of the Lord in the Old Testament to the coming of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. 22 times in the Old Testament, for example, Ezekiel chapter 30 verse 3, for the day is near, the day of the Lord is near, a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. 2 Peter 3, this is a New Testament verse, 3.10, for the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Amos 5, 18, woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear, and as though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall only to have a snake bite him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch dark without a ray of brightness? It's going to be a day where God intervenes in history and judges the earth and purges it of all evil and all sin. Isaiah 13, 6, wail for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Now, maybe you've heard about scriptures about the day of the Lord before, and I was just reading these yesterday. I said there's 22 of them in the Old Testament. That Isaiah 13, 6 is a good example. Wail. For the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. 
But when you really begin to, to think about it, that God comes down and judges the sin of mankind, judges this earth for all the sin of all the evil that's going to be upon it, um, it it's going to be worse than we think. And just to give you an idea of this, how it struck me yesterday, you know, I, I looked up this Isaiah 13, 6, there the Lord, and then I just kept reading. So let me just read it to you, and, and uh, maybe you'll feel it like I felt it. Wail, well, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Because of this, all hands will go limp. Every man's heart will melt. Terror will seize them. Pain and anguish will grip them. They will rise like a woman in labor, they will look aghast at each other, their faces of flame. See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The, saint, the stars of heaven and their constellation will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. I will punish the world for its evil, and the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance and the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. I will make man scarcer than pure gold, more rare than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord Almighty in the day of his burning anger, the day of the Lord. And sometimes we look at the day of the Lord and we think it's going to happen in a day, but you, in Scripture when you see the, the phrase day of the Lord, it can mean either a day or it can mean a, a period of time. Like sometimes we might say, well, you know, back in the day, it just, you know, it means a period of time. And this is a sense of the day of the Lord, that it's going to actually be a period of time. And most people believe that the seven years, what we call the tribulation, uh, is, is what we're really talking about. You think about the book of the Revelation that deals with uh, a seven-year time period. We refer to it as the, the revelation. Sometimes it's referred to as a time of Jacob's trouble. And uh, uh, it starts in about chapter 6 of the book of the Revelation. Some people say, well, where does this seven-year tribulation come from? Probably a better name for it would be Daniel's 70th week is where we get the idea from it. So, so just for today, I just want to take a little dive into an Old Testament particular prophet of scripture to see where this idea of a seven-year tribulation comes from. It's Jesus who calls it the tribulation. He really calls it the great tribulation, referring to the last three and a half years. But the whole seven-year time period comes from a, a prophecy found in the book of Daniel, all right? So if you have your Bible, you can open up to Daniel chapter 9, kind of a famous, probably one of the more famous prophecies in the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 9. And uh, you guys remember with Daniel, Daniel was a, an Israelite and he was taken captive by the, by the Babylonians. So there was a day because of the sin of Israel, the Babylonians came down, conquered the nation of Israel and took the people in it into exile in the Babylonian. It's what's known as the exile of the Jewish people. And Daniel was one of the very first people taken. All right, he was taken as a young man, him, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And if you remember the story, you know, he wouldn't eat the food and all that. He was a, probably a teenager. By the time we get to Daniel chapter 9, he's been in Babylon for 66 years, okay? So if he came when he was a teenager, now 66 years have passed. He'd been in his 80s, okay? And he's, and he's, and he's reading scripture one day. You know, no miss November. I'm reading some scripture every day. He's reading the scripture, and he comes across the scripture that's a prophecy from the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was alive. He lived in Jerusalem at the time they went into exile. And he was the prophet. And he wrote a letter to the exiles. And in that letter, he, he, he basically wrote them. And uh, he said, hey, you're only going to be in exile for 70 years. Okay. And Daniel one day is reading scriptures which recorded for us in chapter 9, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of, Israel, of Jerusalem would last for 70 years. We actually have this prophecy recorded for us. It's Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10. Jeremiah writes, Thus saith the Lord, When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. So 66 years earlier, Jeremiah writes, 70 years Here's Daniel, he's reading scripture. He comes across this passage of scripture and he's like, wow, 70 years. I've been here 66. It's almost time for us to, God's gonna somehow miraculously send us all home, which he did, okay? Miraculously through Cyrus, there was a degree issued to send them all home. Anybody that wanted to went home. Ezra went down there, built a temple. Nehemiah went down there, right? Took a bunch of people with him and rebuilt Jerusalem. So here's Daniel. He reads this. He believes it. He's like, God, I gotta start praying this will happen. 
So he begins to pray that God would forgive the sins of the Israelites and take them back home. And he prays this prayer. It's recorded for us in Daniel chapter 9. It's unbelievable. You should read it just to see how amazing this guy was. And God answers his prayer, and he sends a, an angel named Gabriel down okay, to answer his prayer. Now, I don't know if this guy showed up personally or showed up in a vision, but it says in chapter 9, verse 23, Daniel, Gabriel says to Daniel, as soon as you began to pray, an answer was given, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. Verse chapter, 20, chapter 9, verse 24, 77s are decreed or determined for your people and your holy city. 77s are decreed for your people, the Jewish people, and your holy city, the city of Jerusalem. 77s. Now, the context of this passage is a 70-year time period. So we're talking about years. But here he takes it further into the future. He says, I'm talking about 77s. So 70, seven-year time periods, 490 years. God says, 490 years, 77s are decreed or determined for your people, the Jews, and for your holy city to do this, to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, which is what Jesus did for us, to bring in everlasting righteousness on this earth, to seal up vision or to fulfill vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. 490 years to do all this. Verse 25, no one understand this. So we need to know and understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, which had not happened yet, until the anointed one, it's the word Messiah, until the Messiah, the ruler comes. So from the, the, the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, which we know to be Jesus, the ruler comes. There will be 77 and 62 sevens. Now, I know you guys all know I'm from Oklahoma, but nonetheless, I can add up 62 sevens and seven sevens. And if you do, you know what you get? 69 sevens. We're one short of the 70 sevens. We've got 69 sevens, 483 years. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble, after this 483 years, the anointed one, the Messiah, will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come. Now, this ruler who will come is a future ruler, so the people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city. This is going to be a future evil person, the man of lawlessness, perhaps, in 2 Thessalonians or some person we might refer to as the Antichrist, the people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. That happened in AD 70 by the Romans. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. He, the ruler who will come, will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. There's our missing seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation, talked about by Jesus in Matthew 24, until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. A lot of stuff going on in this prophecy. I just want to point out one particular thing, that he says this in about 605 B.C. No one understand this, that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the Messiah comes, will be 480 years, 69 sevens. So it does beg the question, you know, what date are we talking about? What issue to rebuild Jerusalem went out. And some people think, well, they immediately think of Ezra who did go to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. But the second option is a guy named Nehemiah. We studied Nehemiah. He was a cupbearer to the king, King Artaxerxes. He was a captive in Babylon and he got the vision to go rebuild Jerusalem. So he had the idea to ask the king about it. It's recorded in Nehemiah 2 verse 4. The king said to me, what is it you want? Nehemiah says, I prayed to the God of heaven. I answered the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. Same exact word. Okay, so then you would say, well, when did the decree then go out for Nehemiah to go rebuild the city of Jerusalem? And it's actually recorded for us in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. 
The month of Nisan is the first month of the year for Jewish people. It's either March or April. It's when we celebrate, when they celebrate Passover, when we celebrate Easter. It changes every year for us because the Jewish people use a lunar calendar based on 360 days in a year, 30 days in a month, whereas we use the Roman calendar based on 365 days. But if you use the Jewish calendar, March, April, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. Now, we know this exact date because uh, King Artaxerxes was a secular king and secular people kept really good records of this. In fact, I just Googled it up yesterday. When did King Artaxerxes become king? 465 B.C. We're now in the 20th year, which would make it 445 B.C. So we're talking about March, April, 445 B.C., if you add 483 years to that, using 360 day in a year, you come out exactly to March or April 6th, A.D. 32, the exact date most scholars believe that Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem on the triumphal entry. From the issuing of the decree to the day the anointed one comes. This is Jesus, man. This is like one of the most... I mean, there's lots of different ways you can look at this, but it's an incredible prophecy given to us. The day that Jesus would come. Now, when Jesus came, he came as the Messiah, the anointed one, the ruler. But guess what? The Jews didn't recognize him as such. Instead of recognizing him, they rejected him and crucified him, and he was cut off. Right? Just like it said in Scripture, that, but he will be cut off at the end of that. So when Jesus came, if they would have recognized Jesus and accepted him as Messiah, it would have ushered in that last seven years of the plan that God had for the nation of Israel, but instead they rejected him. And when they rejected him and crucified him, a very good thing happened. It actually opened up the door for Gentiles, which most of us are Gentiles, non-Jewish, for Gentiles to be saved, Right? And it entered into a time of what's known as a time of the Gentiles. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 11, verse 11. Again, I ask, did they, the Jews, stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? He says, no, not at all. Rather, because of their transgressions and crucifying Jesus, salvation has come to the Gentile. And this ushered in a time what's known as a time of the Gentile. The Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. We know this. It started what's known as the church age. Right? So it's almost like God's got this plan for the nation of Israel. It gets all the way down to the 69th week. And when they rejected Jesus, like their plan was put on hold. And all at once, this time of the Gentiles became available, the church age in which we're living. And all sorts of Gentiles are being saved, giving their lives to Christ. Romans chapter 11, verse 25, Paul goes on to say, Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. It's almost like there's a certain number. And when the full number of Gentiles comes in, that part of history is going to end and God is going to kick back in and finish off the last seven years of his plan he had for the nation of Israel. The last seven years, Daniel's 70th missing week is what's covered in Revelation 6 to the end of the book. The first three chapters of the book of the Revelation deal with the seven churches of the Revelation, which gives a whole time period of the church age. The last year of the word church is the last word in the last verse of chapter 3 of the book of Revelation, you never hear about it again. Why? Because at some point in the middle of that, we're going to get raptured and taken out, and God's going to come back and deal with the nation of Israel, purge the earth, and do what he's going to do. You say, Kurt, when's that going to happen? Nobody knows when it's going to happen. So how do you respond when you don't know something's going to happen, but you know it is going to happen? All you can do is be ready. you got to be ready. And the only way you can be ready is to give your life to Jesus Christ. Because in those days, if people are going to be saying, peace and safety, you know, pe people are going to be saying, peace and safety, and then destruction will come upon them suddenly. Why? Because that was the, that was the slogan of the Roman Empire. Hey, just trust your empire. You'll have peace and safety. And people do that today. We trust in the government. We trust in our military. We trust in our nation. We trust in our paycheck. We trust in our money. We trust in our position. We trust in how tough we are, how smart we are. When Jesus Christ returns, that's not going to save you. When Jesus Christ returns, only one thing going to save you, and that's having a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's going to come back suddenly. Whenever you see a judgment in, in any type of scripture, it's always the non-believers that never see it coming. Why? Because they're in darkness. And that's what Paul says, but you brothers are not in darkness. 
You're not in darkness, so this should overtake you like a thief. Why? Because you're sons and daughters of the light. God's given us Jesus as a light, and he's revealed to us his plan. So we should never be, we should be ready. We have to always be ready because we are not in darkness. When you're in darkness, you, you can't see where you're going. You don't know what's going to happen, and that makes you afraid. If you're in the light, guess what? You know exactly where you're going. You know exactly what's going to happen. And so, therefore, we don't have to be afraid because we are not destined for wrath, but for salvation in, in Jesus Christ, right? So we got to be a, 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 a ready, and we got to be alert. If you're a child of the light, stop living in the darkness. Stop living in the darkness, right? Like, I shared this story with you. You know, I went to Peru earlier this year, and uh, when I went to Peru, the pastor invited us to go on a monkey hunt. Uh, to, one of them takes monkey hunting in the Amazon jungle. And uh, I think there was five of us in the group, but only me and my son-in-law, TJ, went because everybody else assumed that monkey hunt meant snipe hunt, just in a different language, <laughs> right? And he said, you know, he's going to take you out there in the jungle and leave you, and you're going to die. So there's a good possibility, but I'm still not going to miss out on it. So <laughs> we took this little single shot, 16 gauge, a bunch of flashlights, and our interpreter went with us, and we went down this path to go hunt monkeys into the jungle of Amazon. We left about 10.30 at night, and when we got about midnight, our path just kept getting skinnier and skinnier. We were crossing logs, going across these. We were out there in the middle of nowhere. I still thought it was a snipe hunt. I'm like, bro, just I think maybe it's time to turn around. It's like midnight. The pastor's like, oh, no, man. We're going to go off over here in the woods and see if we can shoot something. You guys just stay right here. Well, all there was was this little path. And so we're standing there, me and my interpreter and TJ, and I said, hey, turn off your flashlight. Let's just see how dark it is. <laughs> so we, we all turned our flashlights off. Dude, I'm telling you, it was so black out there. Like the village that we stayed in didn't even have electricity, and it was miles away. We're just under the canopy of the Amazon jungle. We turned our lights off. It, you literally could not see your hand from your face. For some reason, I thought that was pretty funny. I guess I just thought, this is hilarious, dude. It's so dark out here. My gosh, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I couldn't even see. They were standing right there by me. You couldn't even tell. I'm like, if you get off this path, we're going to die for sure because you'd never find it again in the dark, right? And so I kind of said that. I said, man, if, if we didn't have our flashlights, our only hope for survival would for the three of us just to sit down in the middle of this path and just wait till daylight because that's the only way we're going to get home. We're just going to have to sit right, which nobody wanted to do because, you know, everybody was convinced there was like a tiger or something out there. But I'll just say it. Hey, we're just going to sit. Because if you step off this path, we're never going to find it again. So we just got to sit there. And when I said that, my interpreter just was like, because I was standing right beside him, he was like. <laughs> he was so close to me. He was just like, please, Kurt, don't leave me out here. <laughs> and then I was like, I, just, I said, hey, bro, just relax, man. Me and TJ are Americans. We are prepared, dude. I got this flashlight. I got a flashlight on my phone. He's got a flashlight on his phone. He's got a flashlight. I got another flashlight in my pocket, and I got extra batteries in the other pocket, brother. I'm prepared for this moment, all right? I mean, my flashlight, not even a small. It's like 350 lumens, man. I said, hey, don't worry about it, bro. I got the light. Here's the path. We're going to make it home, right? Hey, man, it's what Jesus says to all you. He said, I don't know, this, this end of the time thing is going to be crazy. But if you know Jesus, you got the light, you know the path, he's going to get you home, man. No reason to be afraid. He's working a plan. It's going to come to fruition. And as children of the day, it's going to be a great day. Living the children of the light, not in the darkness. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, God. Thank you for the privilege. Just talk about that you've given us an idea of what's going to happen. But in the midst of all that, you said that through Jesus, we have the privilege, whether we're alive or asleep, we get to live with you forever. We get to live with you forever. Because you died, we don't have to. So I pray for the people in the room today that are not ready. They're kind of waiting. They're holding out on this Jesus thing. Now, I'm just going to wait a little bit. Amen can't wait because it will come when you least expect it. You've got to be prepared. You've got to get ready. You've got to be alert. We need to live like children of the light. Do the work that God's given us to do, man, because our time's short, Father. We give you glory for your grace.
makes it possible for us through Jesus. Pray it in his name. Amen. I'm going to ask.